<laughs> All right, buddy, we are live. Welcome in latest episode of that SEC podcast. I'm your host, Michael Braddon. I go by SEC Mike on Twitter. And that there is Cousin Shane, a sick bastard who goes by <laughs> Big Orange Vols. What's up, yo, Tissy Hober? <laughs> hey, buddy, what's going on? <laughs> he's sick, but he's still drinking. I mean, that, mm. that's a trooper right there. You know what? That's what the doctor ordered, you know. That's how you got to knock it out. So, yeah, I got I got bit with a little bit of a bug. I don't know what it is, but my wife had a version of it, my kids. So I, I, I call it the perfect storm. My wife, she hates when I do this, but I always say, you, she says, how you feeling? I said, you remember when you were real sick? I was like, multiply that by seven. She calls it the man <laughs> flu. That's what I've got. <laughs> so you just, you just had to one-up her once again, huh, Shane? Absolutely. Well, I told her right before I came over, she was like, you feeling any better? I was like, well, you know, you've had childbirth, you know. I was like, it's like that times two, you know. <laughs> so, no, I, 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 obviously I, I, I will survive this thing. It's just upper – nose thing whatever but uh it ain't COVID at least you know i've had that about eight times i think i finally um i finally have whatever just right move so on Cousin Shane, <laughs> he reached out to me earlier he said by god i'm under the weather you better find some clips to carry this show so <laughs> we got you absolutely loaded shane and we're going to uh we got arkansas we got south carolina mississippi state georgia old miss florida texas alabama key Tucky. To hit on. So let's get into the action. Chad, also, good friend of the show, Stephen Lassen, of course, senior editor over at Athlon Sports. You know, he's putting together the Athlon books, uh, Shane, and, he, and he's given me the SEC returning starter figures across the SEC. So we're going to dive into that in just a second. But I'm going to throw you a little curveball here, Shane. All right. We like to start with something fun if we can. Here's a story from Derrick Henry. Of course, we all know him. Alabama great, killing it in the NFL. He, he shares this story. Nick Saban got tired of all them Crimson Tide players celebrating after scoring. Let's kick it over to Derrick Henry. <laughs> we was in um we was in the meetings, you know, because Saban he old school could stand if anybody scored and um and wanted to celebrate afterwards. So <laughs> We in the meeting one day after the game, forgot who he played, and he pulling up, uh, he pulling up film, he's showing everybody. Then he he to my and you guys, you stop doing all that showboating, doing all that uh, praying hands and uh, act like you thanking God. And then later on that night, 12 o'clock, you're down there, got black and mouths, got liquor, you're chasing me, bro. It's like, well, get a hold of that. We were crying. We couldn't do nothing but laugh because he was right. So, uh, you do your prayer here, you get on one knee. Then 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock comes, you're down there smoking black and mouths on the corner, drinking, drinking liquor, smoking. All the time, <laughs> chasing, chasing girls. That shit, man, that shit was so funny, bro. I was like, bro, he, he was tired of y'all. <laughs> All right, so I knew Saban smart enough to know what's going on at night, and that comes from a, via a show called The Pivot. Uh, I'm, I'm familiar yeah. with it, but it looks like old Ryan Clark, another SEC legend, is the host of that show. So I, I just thought you'd love that one. Yeah, absolutely. We've all been there, you know. A lot of ball fans were there Sunday, you know. You go to Easter Church, you're feeling good. You, you come out, you're, you're kind of rejuvenated, and next thing you know, you're cussing at the TV because they keep throwing the ball to the big guy down the bottom. So, <laughs> All right, Chase, so let's get over to uh, this uh, SEC returning starters. And, and again, this, this could change because we've got the portal coming up. But uh, I know Steven was hard at work at this, so I just wanted to share these numbers because some of them are pretty surprising to me, Shane. I, I threw them up here on the board, but how about it? I mean, I again, if is as if we needed any other reasons to believe in the Georgia Bulldogs, Shane. Georgia leads the entire SEC. Well, technically they're tied with Kentucky, but nobody's got more than Georgia and Kentucky returning with 15 starters back from last year's team. At and again, that's a little bit more impressive with Georgia, which. Damn near dominated every game aside from one. How about Florida? Here's a big reason I like the Gators, Shade. 14 <laughs> returning starters. Uh -huh. Second highest, technically third, but second, you know, second highest number here in all the SEC. Mizzou and Ole Miss. Why we keep talking up Mizzou, Ole Miss, Shane? They killed it in the portal. They each bringing back 13 starters from last year to Missouri and Ole Miss. LSU and AM both bringing back 12 starters from last year. 
Alabama, Auburn, South Carolina, and Texas all have 11 starters returning from last season. Arkansas, 10. Oklahoma and Tennessee. Josh Heupel Bowl once again here. They each got nine starters returning. Vanderbilt, poor Vanderbilt, second to last year with eight. And here's a big reason why, again, I hope it's a new era on Mississippi State, but it's hard to get excited when you got three returning starters from last year's squad. Of course, I think you could spin it, Shay, to say, well, we were so awful last year, we had to kick all those guys to the curb and bring in new ones. So maybe I found the silver lining there for Mississippi State, but only three returning starters for Jeff Levy and company that was technically Jeff Levy wasn't even there. But uh, that that really stood out to me. Yeah, and, and Mississippi State, obviously, it's going to be some growing pains, and that's why we say it, just to have that much turnover. But – you know, state fans also are like, hey, this is a new chapter. Let's start with a clean slate here. So I, I think there is a little bit of a silver lining. But some of those teams that really stood out to me, obviously Georgia sitting there, here's a team that was one game away from being in a college football playoff. And usually that's a team that has to reload. And it doesn't feel like they're going to have to do it as much coming into this season. Also, you mentioned Florida. I think that's very intriguing because last year – what really got them was some of that youth that was on that squad, just stupid young mistakes. And do they learn from that? Do they grow from that? And if so, who knows, man? Maybe maybe Florida's a team that surprises people. Yep. All right, buddy. Well, let's get into it. We, like I said, we got a ton of clips, and we got some pretty uh, important news. Not officially named the starting quarterback, but uh, again, Maybe old uh, Bobby Petrino jumped the gun, Shade, we're, and we're already getting some some interesting dynamic between Petrino and uh, old Sam Pippen. But here on Tuesday, Bobby Petrino met with the media, Arkansas offensive coordinator, of course, and it sounds like it, Shade, they already got themselves a starting quarterback, which was expected, but it's pretty jarring to hear it. Just got to come out of here and say it. We've had good, good work at quarterback. You know, Taylor has kind of been the guy that works with the ones. He's uh, earned that himself from the minute he got here to how he's conducted his business, how he leads, how he studies, uh, how hard he goes, you know, and all the mat drills that we did. He's the first guy winning uh, on the races, so he's done a nice job on that. Uh, I think there's a good competition for who's going to be number two, and I'm really not sure who that is right now. Um, Malachi, Jacoby, and KJ, the youngster, have all had their bright spots uh, and then made mistakes and had some spots that, you know, aren't what we want. Uh, I think it's been hard on Jacoby as far as, you know, the third new offense and how he's got to get there, not not necessarily mentally, but the drops and the things that we do different are different to him. So he's got to catch his feet up. Um, he's got a great arm, and he's working hard at it, and I love his attitude. Uh, I just think he needs to catch up with our techniques and the timing because everything for us is timing, um, and he's come from different systems than that. So, uh, but I, I think t I think he had a really good week last week, and he had a good day today. So that's that's good. When Taylor entered the transfer portal, um, I think he said maybe a day or two after uh, you guys hit him up, and uh, you recruited him out of high school. I was just curious how that process unfolded when you recognized that he was in the portal, and just I guess going back to the recruitment, how you identified that he was the guy that you wanted. Well, one of the things that was fun at, at Missouri State is I had a bunch of young guys on the staff and aggressive and aggressive recruiters and. They brought Taylor and Timmy and showed them. They're all fired up. They've had great talks with them. And I said, we ain't getting him. We ain't getting him. <laughs> Sorry, guys. We're not getting him. Oh, no, Coach, he, he likes us. And I said, yeah, we're not going to get him um, just because of his ability, you know, his size and, str and speed and the way he can throw the ball. Uh, but I, re I did remember him on that. And when I got here, Coach Pitt said, go get a quarterback. Um, do whatever you want to do, go get us a quarterback. And um, so I had help with, with Miles Fishback as an is a, uh, analyst for us, and then Will, um, our graduate assistant. And we scoured, you know, the portal everywhere and uh, traveled around the country. I really liked Talon. I liked his video. I liked what other coaches said about him. I talked to Barry about him because Barry played with him, played against him in the um, – championship game I think it was and 
And then I went out and met him. And the thing I was most impressed was when I was talking to him, I could see him picturing the plays and the formations and everything in his mind and his ability to do that. And I've always felt that's the one thing that a quarterback has to be able to do. That's how you get better on the sideline when you come off uh, the field. That's how you get better at halftime is that I can say something to him, he can see it and understand, you know, what I'm talking about coverage-wise or route-wise. And uh, and then I just liked his motivation. He was He's a very highly motivated young man. He spends more time in that building than anybody. Um, he's got this little routine he goes through where he takes his iPad out on the field and watches video and does his footwork. And uh, so he's going to just continue to get better and better. All right, Shane, and, and for those that don't know anything about Taylor Green, now that it's, you know, not official, I guess, but that's your offense coordinator. He's called the shots here. He basically, you know, is making it official. He was a Mountain West freshman player of the year two years ago. He's six foot seven. He's a legitimate six Ooh. foot seven, Shane. And yeah. believe it or not, at that at that uh, at that build, he he is incredibly fast. If if you just look up his highlights. It's basically, uh, you know, half of it is just him running, running away from people. Uh, I, I think this is, makes Arkansas very, very intriguing with Taylor Green. The fact that we're barely into April here, and we got us a starting quarterback for the Arkansas Razorbacks. That was a huge question mark, and that's a lot of what, you know, whether this is fair or not, Shane. That's what a lot of these these SEC pre predictions and the power rankings and what have you is. Well, we don't know who the quarterback is. We don't know what we got. But it certainly sounds like Bobby Petrino and Arkansas know what they got in uh, at starting quarterback Taylor Green. Not just know what they got, but excited about what they have. And I think that's why there's a little extra pep in the Arkansas Razorback steps today. I, I've noticed online a lot more people are, are are getting excited and pumped up about this this season because of the quarterback being named Bobby, what he brings to the table, so many, so many new pieces. Um, I, I'm pumped up for him. I think this is a a, a good move, and uh, and coming out here and naming a quarterback this early, this is what this is what you have to have, Mike, because we can't have quarterback controversy going into week one with with. Let's face it, Coach Pittman with his back against the wall. We need a lot of this stuff locked down when kickoff happens. Right. And so they had a scrimmage over the weekend, Shane. Uh, Taylor Green obviously started the scrimmage there. Uh, started the game with two touchdowns. 75-yard touchdown drive, a 65-yard touchdown drive. Satania, one of the, one of the fastest yeah. players on the team, he caught a touchdown. And remember, uh, freshman standout last year, tight end Luke Haas, he caught a touchdown. And that's another guy. We played enough of Bobby Petrino there, but also in that presser, you know, there's a, who's who's standing out. He says Luke Haas. That was the first name off his that he mentioned, saying he's a special talent. He's going to be Taylor Green's best friend. And I, another thing that I thought was pretty interesting, Shane, he said they're going to be mixing up the tempo so that they can go really quick. But I also think, you know, I, I've even criticized Kiffin and, and Heupel for this. I, I know they're they're in, based entirely on going tempo, but when you ain't getting first downs, that kills your defense. So yeah. I, I think at Arkansas, you can't just go 90 miles per hour at all times. At, at Sometimes you're going to have to chew up the clock as well. So I'm just loving what I'm hearing from Bobby Petrino this spring. Yeah, you know, and again, they're in their headsets now, you know. So you got a, you got a new guy like that. You can kind of help them. Because think about how many times you got a new quarterback out there or a young quarterback, and they make stupid mistakes, especially with time management. We're not going to see that as much now when you got Bobby telling you what to do, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah, so I, I, again, we got an answer at Arkansas where we don't have an answer. South Carolina, Shay. So let's kick it over. Shay Beamer, this comments from today. He was asked about the quarterback competition, kind of danced around it, which, uh, yeah, you know, let's play the clip and then I'll ask you about it. Has there been any separation in the quarterback competition? And besides perfection, what do you want to see from your quarterback Saturday? Uh, I wouldn't say separation. And those guys are continuing to battle. Obviously, when you talk about uh, going in the stadium and guys being able to separate themselves, that's a position that they'll all get a lot of reps on Saturday and um, a lot of reps. And they'll get an opportunity to kind of show how they handle 
operating the offense with the coaches not out there telling them everything and, and coaching every single rep. Uh, so I think there, you know, some guys will there'll be some separation on Saturday. I would imagine just because how you know how we're going to set it up, and, and you hope there is. But there's great competition going in there. A lot of those guys are getting reps, and they're all competing and making each other better. Uh, the biggest thing, Phil, I would say is just one, how they operate. Okay, they're in the stadium now, and it's a scrimmage, game-like setting with officials and everything. How, uh, you know, do can, can, can guys operate? Can they run the offense and, and communicate and the things that you have to do? And then certainly protecting the, protecting the ball. They've done a really good job of that. As the head coach, you know, you love it when – there's a lot of turnovers from a defensive standpoint because they're taking the ball away. And then you don't like it as an offensive coach or as a head coach because the offense is turning the ball over too much. And then when the offense doesn't turn it over, you're excited for the offense, but you're like, man, we got to continue to take the ball away like we've done a great job of defensively. But the last two practices, um, we've uh, we've done a really good job offensively of uh, protecting the football. I think there was one turnover today, I didn't, one interception today, but it was a ball that got kind of ricocheted, bang, bang play with a receiver and a DB, and the ball popped up in the air, and, and it was a DQ Smith running to the ball and made an interception. But for the most part, the quarterbacks have done a good job of making good decisions and want to see them continue to just uh, – uh, do that on Saturday for sure. So he had a lot to say there, Shane, but he didn't really say much at all, which, again, it's it's early. But, you know, just because Arkansas is naming a starting quarterback doesn't mean South Carolina has to come out here and, and name a quarterback. But that, to me, sounds like a guy that has no clue who his starting quarterback is going to be. Do you think uh, – and I know this sounds crazy, but remember the portal is about to open back up. Do you think there's a little bit of this word game going to be played down there? Because Robbie was in the same spot last year, if you remember, with Coach Freeze going back and forth. I don't know. It's the order. You know, it, it makes me think that there may be a little chess being played here and say, hey, let's make it a quarterback competition until it no longer needs to be one. Right. And, and you know, that's not something a lot of people talk about, Shane, but that's <laughs> – as we move forward in this wild world of college football, this, that's what spring could be. We could sit here and say, okay, we've reset the roster. Where are we a, a player or two away? Maybe we've got abs- – I mean, maybe their quarterbacks are, are elite in a year or two. But if we want to compete at a high level in the SEC today, we need to upgrade at that, at that position. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's fair to say. Now, will they have the money to go in and, and go grab one? I, I don't know. So uh, there, there's a lot of – questions there that that can't be answered at this point in time but that that's not even something i was thinking about shade i was just thinking about <laughs> man i i'm trying to figure out what the hell he's talking about here what it, it sounds like he didn't even mention any of the quarterbacks there yeah it's, it must be these drugs i'm taking mike it's like limitless you know or limit <laughs> is that what it's called where he just, <laughs> uh like lucy i got 10 percent more of my brain right now <laughs> <laughs> well, I just appreciate Cousin Jeff in the comments, Shane. He said, who gets fired first, Shane Beamer or Sam Pittman? And then Cousin Benny says, Napier. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't us saying it. That's, uh, that's them saying it. But I, I just thought that was hilarious. I just say, I find it funny going back, Bobby Petrino. This is two years in a row that that he is kind of the talk of the SEC as far as coordinators. Like, what, what other right. coordinator are we talking about as much as Bobby last year and how he'll fit in with Jimbo and then now how he's going to fit in with Arkansas? Uh, right. I think my favorite comment was he was – uh, the volleyball one. You gotta, you gotta be careful, coach. You know, I thought about that when they said six, seven quarterback. I was like, he'd be a hell of a volleyball player. <laughs> now, I, again, I could be my hard time, but Shane, they they just landed one of the top prospects in the entire country. This potentially a game changing addition, defensive end, Dylan Stewart, five star. They beat out literally everybody in the country to land this kid. Could he be? Could he be a a, a game wrecker? That kind of changes the defense. Let's kick it over to Beamer one more time. You mentioned Dylan Stewart a minute ago. What has stood out about him so far as he works to get acclimated to college ball? Probably just the natural God-given size and ability. Um, si, he's, he's big. He can run. He can jump. He's physical. Um, he's just uh, – uh, He's not your typical freshman, without a doubt. And obviously, he was very highly recruited for a reason. But he's another one that you don't 
you don't notice him. He's just he's just out there. You notice him, but you don't notice him in regards for the wrong reasons. He's just kind of steady, does his job day in, day out, and <clears throat> and uh, has fit in well with that group. And um, to me, just continuing to learn the the techniques that we want to play with and, and the techniques that we're coaching and the effort that we want to play with, but doing a lot of really good things for us out there right now. So that's what you want to hear about a freshman, Shane. But, you know, they were saying – well, actually, now that I think of it, I don't even think Nicholas Harbor, I don't, I, if memory serves, I don't even think he was there for spring last year. I think he showed up during the summer. But I, w I wanted to ask you about that. The, remember, five star freshman last year came in, made some plays. He's an incredible athlete, too. He's, he's tall. He's, he's, I think he's the fastest player on the team, but he's running track this spring. So he is uh, not really a full participant, or he's, he's not. He's not a full participant this spring. And considering we got, New receivers coach, same offense, but new receivers coach. We really need someone to step up. And, and that kid, Nicholas Harbor, he's got all the talent in the world. He could be not only our best receiver, he could be our best overall player if he unlocks his full potential, which he has not come close to doing. How do you feel about a guy that we are really going to rely on in the fall not spending time uh, or at, at least fully committed to football in the spring? Does, does that concern it, you at all? Yeah. Yeah, it does because again, it, you're this is a kid that you expect to start shining later in the season, as he gets acclimated with the quarterback. You know, because again, we got new quarterback. We got it's just a whole not a new system, but you know what I'm saying. It's it's knowing where your guy's going to be. Mm -hmm. You know, he is he is lightning fast, and if you know goggles ain't used to throwing to somebody that fast, he may start throwing behind them <laughs> or something like that. You know, and, and then and then maybe he doesn't have the confidence to throw toward him. So you know, obviously you kind of knew what this arrangement was going to be when you took him in. You know, this is a kid that potentially could compete in the Olympics. You know, I mean, he's right. just he is a freak athlete, but. With that comes, you know, some some moments you're not going to have them. So I, I think what's going to be important with him is the work that he does in the off season. So when we hit these summer months, you know, the these quarterbacks and, and receivers they get together. You know, that's when they're going to have to really work extra on that chemistry. Right. Well, another place they're they're having to work overtime, Shane, on all that because it's new all over. Remember, we just did Mississippi State three returning starters. And again, maybe that's not a bad thing given what we saw. But we got Jeff Lebby down here, Shane. Uh, you know, these these are not uh, you know outstanding comments or anything, but I I think it kind of evokes the change, the excitement that Mississippi State fans have as the Jeff Lebby era is underway here, spring in Starkville. When you kind of took this job for your expectations and. And you know what you kind of had to now. I mean, how how has your confidence in kind of the job you've done and the roster that you've got? How has it kind of grown the uh, last couple of months? Yeah, the the people I'm around every day have created confidence. You know, we, I think we've got an incredible staff, guys that are great teachers, great connectors, great coaches, and then our, our football team's in a really good place right now. Again, we've got a ton of work to do. We're nowhere close to where we're going to be by the time we go kick it off, but. And just the attitude and the effort and the commitment to wanting to be great has been really, really good. And that's that's created confidence for everybody. What's, um, I, I guess, uh, for you, like, personally, you know, I mean, adjusting to, to being a head coach so far, how, how's it gone for you? How have you, how have you liked it and how do you think you're kind of settling in? No, it's, it's been great. Again, it's been incredibly busy, but it's been great. we got great people in the building. We've got great energy in Starkville. We've got great energy around the program right now. This town has been special uh, just from a welcoming standpoint. So uh, made everybody feel in incredibly welcome. And so it's, it's been great. It really has. And it's a lot, but it'll continue to be a lot. And that's, that's part of it, which I'll take all of it. Now, Shane, I can't remember if I told you this or not, or if I shared this on the show, but I was told not that long ago. Remember all the uh, Lane Kiffin uh, speculation for – for would he go to Auburn and all that? Yeah. Apparently the guy, had he had he left, again, it, I don't even know if he was actually, you know, considering Auburn, but that was the popular rumor at the time. Had he left for Auburn, Ole Miss was going to name Jeff Levy head coach down there in Oxford. Now he's in the state. He's at Mississippi State, and now he, him and Kiffin don't get along too well. But I say all that, Shane, because I saw on social media, uh, you know, there was a someone posted uh, the the clip we played a couple days ago. Lane Kiffin cheat code with the mics and the helmets and all that. Yeah, and they said Lane Kiffin 
And Ole Miss will benefit the most of anybody in the country with these mics and everything. And I, I, I said, oh, I don't think so. I think you got you got the right state, you got the wrong team. I think it's Mississippi State, and I'll tell you why. Because with new offense, new quarterback, everything's new, terminology, the, the players, everything. Jeff Levy is an elite play caller. He's going to be in the ear of that quarterback. I think, you know, Heupel and, and Nico, you know, they've been together two years. Uh, Lane Kiffin, Jackson Dart, they've been together three years now. It will help. I'm not saying it won't help them, but I, I feel like there's there's enough communication there to where I, I think a mic like this is going to really benefit teams like Mississippi State that's kind of starting from scratch. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I think that's important because you go back to Steve's list of returning starters too, you know. There's just so much newness that's where that's coming in down there. But one thing I have noticed with this program, and I don't know if it's more of the social media team or anything like that, but I'm kind of buying into the brotherhood, you know. I, I'm seeing a lot of a lot of videos and, and, and content coming out with them as team members together. And, you know, it, it just there's no pressure at state, you know, that, that there is no, nobody's expecting them to win nine games, 10 games. Nobody's expecting Levy to, to, to beat old Miss, old Miss year one. But that's, that's the beauty of it because I do think there's going to be a, an underlining excitement to that program just because state, Went through so much last year watching probably some of the most god awful football you've ever witnessed, <laughs> and and now it's going to be fun again. Football is going to be fun again there in Mississippi State. That there'll be people there, and they may not win as many games as you'd like, but by God, they're going to put some points on the board. Right, and if you look at that schedule, Shane, I mean, right out the gate, they have an opportunity. I mean, certainly they'll they'll beat. Uh, I always forget who in the hell that is. Eastern Kentucky. Yeah, it's Eastern Kentucky. But Arizona State's always uh, about six months away from po- probation, so they'll probably be on probation by then. I, I mean, it would not be a stunner if you beat Arizona. Let's just give them that one because, I mean, SEC, I don't even know what conference Arizona State's in anymore. Let's give them that one. Toledo, you got to feel like you're going to win that one at home. Right. It, it, there's no guarantee you're 3-0, and but I think it's very realistic that that could happen. And then you got Florida coming in, fourth week of the season, into Starful, and Billy Napier's back against the wall. I mean, every time they don't win by 20 points, people are going to be questioning Billy Napier. Is he even going to be here? Yada, uh-huh. yada, yada. Um, I think State's got nothing to lose heading into that Florida game and a real opportunity if they – you know, can can I, I I would favor Florida, certainly. I'm not sitting here just trying to go through the schedule and say, oh, we're going 12 and 0. But don't you pull that thing up again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, there's a real opportunity to go three and zero going into SEC play with, with a very manageable uh start to the to the conference slate. Absolutely. I mean, you talk about I'm not saying I, I hate to say it, but their Super Bowl. You beat in Florida week four, starting out four and oh. That's a pretty damn good start there. So right. I, I think that's – obviously the, the goal is one at a time. But, but yeah, they're going to have to start out strong if they're going to make a bowl game and get those extra practices at the end of the season. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's just going to be fun to get, fun to watch them. So I right. like his hat too, by the way. It's a, <laughs> yeah. it's a killer hat. I'd like to have one of those. Well, I'll tell you, Shane, where they're going to have some real fun this uh, fall. Where have they been having fun for – the better part of three years. And that's in Athens, of course, Shay, with Kirby Smart and company. They're so pissed off that they only, what, they go 14 and one, uh, 13 and one, what have you. I mean, they and they were killing people while they were doing it. And I'm just going to play this clip for you, Shay, because I think Kirby was in a mood. This this was from today. They had a scrimmage over the weekend. And, uh, you know, you, you may not see what I'm doing here, but but I'll I'll hit you with it on the other side. And I think you'll agree with me here. Kirby, um, there was some, I guess, stuff out there about the scrimmage. I guess you mentioned Arian Smith made a play. Uh, Dylan Bell, I wasn't there. Could, could you highlight some of the guys, Rod Robinson, that are coming around at the skill position? There's obviously receivers to replace in your top two running backs. Well, I think it's, it's kind of, I kind of look at it like, what scrimmage have we had that the skill player didn't make a play? And what scrimmage do we have that a defensive player didn't make a play? The issue is 
you guys may not know about it. You just hear about it, and then I guess a big deal's made. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't look at it that way. Arian had an explosive play, but we also had a bust on defense. So was it Arian or was it the defense? You know, um, Dylan Bell had a, had a had a great catch, but Dylan Bell's had great catches all over the place. You know, he, he it's, it's not. I don't know. I, I don't get into it like it's like these couple guys just blew it out of the water. Oh gosh, these expectations are so great. I look at it as the defense sometimes messed up, and we also had some sacks. Well, did we have sacks because we had great pass rushers or because the back didn't block the blitzer? Or, you know, we busted and, and, and slid the wrong way and cut a guy free. So, you know, when, if a guy has a dominant performance, I'd be more than happy to mention it. Like, he dominated. He beat every rep. But we didn't have anybody do that. There's nobody that had a dominant performance. Um, guys got lucky and fell into plays. And – as coaches, we don't look at those and uh, and look at that as progress. Sometimes that's taking advantage of what's given to you. And we had a lot of, of those opportunities uh, Saturday because we had a lot of busts. Um, but there's nobody that I can say just you – know, even Rod. I, didn't, I thought Rod had a lot more yards left out there than he had. Um, we didn't have one explosive run the entire scrimmage. So if you don't have explosive runs, you're either not blocking downfield well or you're not making people miss. And, and that's kind of been an M.O. for us. You know, last year it was kind of the same way. All right, Shane, I'll get into why I wanted to play that clip specifically in just a second. But I, I want to give the listeners a little behind the scenes here. Because while, while a clip's going like that, I can uh-huh. see Shane's monitor. You guys can't see it, but I can see it. <laughs> and uh, I, I was scrambling over here because I was trying to mute his mic. I didn't think he knew how to do that. Shane's a little <laughs> under the weather. He's, he was hawk like he was about to sneeze into the damn bike. I, I was like, he's going to ruin this clip. But thankfully, Shane knew how to mute his bike. I, I, I got didn't even it. know you knew how to I do got that. It. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. I got it. It popped up. It says, Mike's requesting me to unmute. I was like, well, let me clean my shit up first before I jump on here. <laughs> uh, but no, the reason I want to play that clip, Shane, because this is where we're at, I think, with, with Georgia, where, oh, I heard Arian Smith made a nice play. I heard Dylan Bell was making plays out there. And Kirby says, hold on. That was a bust here, a bust there. Nobody's good. We ain't done nothing. This is the same as, uh, you know, we were predicted to go 7-5. and five. Nobody thought we could do anything. Everyone picks against us week in and week out, even though we're beating people by 35, 40 points. This is the classic, Shane, where we we don't even have good players. You know, to be like, we got a long way to go. It's a long season, week by week. I mean, I think the real challenge in Athens is just keeping the guys locked in because they know they're they're favored to win every damn game. Yeah, be like Coach Morris in the sweats, you know. They got to earn <laughs> their uniforms, you know. <laughs> just just take their names right off the jerseys because the only way that Georgia wins a game is if they win it together. So, yeah, everybody knows Georgia's got a handful, a, a couple of handfuls of elite talent down there, and you're going to see flashes of that. But, yeah, this is Coach just trying to rein in his cats, just let them know that, hey, we, we got some work left to do. Right. And, I mean, I, and again, I'll throw up our schedule here, Shane. I mean, uh, I know they go to Bama. I know they go to Texas. I know they go to Ole Miss. But they're going to be favored in every day in one of those games. I'm not saying they're going to win them all. But, uh, I mean, this, this may be the most – Short of Florida, this may be the most challenging slate in the country, and you're not hearing anyone talk about it because everybody's confident that that Georgia can go through it at worst, like eleven and one. Right. Well, even that first game, man, I, I have no doubt in my mind that Georgia is going to come out with a with a mission statement against Clemson, and right. and it's going to be it's going to be like dominoes after that, but. You know, when you pull pull up that schedule one more time, because there there are clear cut games you know Georgia's going to be up for. Uh, the first one, Clemson, you got Alabama right there. I, I still think uh, uh, that Auburn is a sneaky game. Kentucky mm-hmm. could be a sneaky game. It's it's that's the one that got Georgia in trouble last year. Not that they lost them, but hell, you remember the last time Georgia and Auburn play? It, it came down to the wire, and it shouldn't have. So, right. uh, I, I think that's the key with with Kirby and and trying to get his boys to focus on task at hand uh, because they are going to be on. I hate to say the word, but revenge tour. That's exactly <laughs> how he's going to dub it down there in Athens. 
Yeah, and how about Cousin Benny? He says, SEC Championship, undefeated Georgia, undefeated Mizzou. I mean, that's not that unrealistic either. So, right. uh, I mean, I can't wait for I mean, and, and Mizzou's given Georgia about a, as good a game as anybody in the last couple of years. You know what? <laughs> exactly. Well, aren't you glad I don't miss the pod for like Olympic events, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what if I told you I've got to do sprints this week? I'm not going to make it, Mike. <laughs> Now on the other end of the spectrum, Shane, I think we, we've had we just had a coach. I think he has to kind of talk his team down. Now we got another coach who I think is he realizes this is the best team he's got, and not that he needs to give them confidence, but I think he's he's letting it know he's letting them know that hey, we got something special. We can make us a run, and I'm talking, of course, Lane Kiffin down here in Oxford. Really been pleased with our guys, you know, focus. And, you know, put a lot on them on install, you know, with the veteran team from a standpoint of older team, but not necessarily all of them being here. And there's a lot of competition. You know, we signed a lot of uh, portal players and that creates competition at spots. And um, it's really good to see. And I think our players understand, you know, our goal is to be really good. And a lot of times, just like in the NFL, that means bringing people in even if it makes some people uncomfortable. So, um, and I think it's really good to be in a second year of a defensive scheme. Just going back a year ago, I felt we were really struggling at this time with a new scheme and new players. And so I think that's been been helpful. And um, I think like Saturday, for instance, in the move the ball, uh, it was, that's probably the best we've looked on defense especially in the front. So I think we've got a chance. Um, you had mentioned kind of being pleased with how the guys are handling the install, throwing a lot at them. Um, does having this old of a team, I guess, on both sides of the ball kind of open up with what you're able to do a little bit more? Yes and no, it does. But then also, even though they've played other places and experience, they are new to ours. But I feel like they pick up better because they're older. I think it is a very, maybe you guys feel out there, a very NFL vibe, you know, because we always have so many new players. But this, I think, more than ever are players that have played a lot, especially in this conference. So it kind of feels more like, okay, here's the free agency and here's all these pieces that have experience and played and some in similar systems to ours. Um, and then piecing them all together. And right or wrong, I've erred on the side of, hey, we're going to do a lot of mental work, we're going to do a lot of practicing, but we're not going to do a lot of tackling, a lot of physical work um, just for the wear and tear of the off season and the season and um, potentially a lot of games. I'm not saying we're going to play a lot of games, but potentially a new format has a lot of games. Shane, he's already preparing to play extra games. He's managing it in April. How many games Ole Miss going to play? 15? Six? I don't know how many you could possibly play, but I think it's 16 or 17 if you go to SEC Championship and a National Championship. But, I mean, he's being smart about it. Better on defense. NFL type team that that is used to being challenged by free agents. I mean, that that's exactly what I want to hear if I'm an Ole Miss fan. Do you see? Do you think that ever changes to be kind of similar to uh, the NFL? You know, they have that trade deadline. Do you think there's some sort of? Do you think that's kind of implemented at some point? You know, that you could go in there and pick somebody up week three. I mean, could you imagine? You, you, you look at some of these teams that maybe lose uh, a couple of linemen. I, I remember Tennessee's particular. You know, is at, at the end, it's like. Who's this guy? You know, like you don't even know this guy on the roster. So it, it feels like maybe something like that. Because if we're gonna kind of mimic the NFL, do you think there'll be some sort of uh, trade? Not trade, but you know what I'm saying. No, like I, maybe I don't a transfer that, pool. Here's where it's going, Shane. And again, I I don't know how they're gonna get this done, but we're gonna get to a point where this is just this is too much with with the player movement and this and that and, and the sal in nil and all that. They're, Here's they should have just already damn done this, but they but they for whatever reason they because they don't want to cut the players in officially, uh -huh. but they're gonna have to do it eventually. And I think what they're gonna do is just a yearly 
contract, salary, whatever the hell you want to call it. But it's not going to be – they're not going to be, be in trading players and, and swap. But it's right. like you sign on January 1, or, or maybe January 1 is probably not a good date, but probably like February 1, and you're you're Ole Miss Rebel till next February 1. I th- I, and they, yeah. they're going to do that across the board. No. Okay. Yeah, I th- I, obviously, I think that's where it's going to go as well. I was just – I was just curious, you know, because he keeps – Lane always does that. He always gets me thinking about where we're going to go. I don't know if he's the ambassador of the transfer portal right now, but it seems <laughs> like that's that's half his answers and questions right now. Right. Well, he's the portal king, they call yeah. him, Shade. <laughs> now, hey, a lot of the similar vibes – not quite. I mean, they're not they're – not, <laughs> I, I almost said they're they're not preparing for uh, 15, 16 games down in Gainesville, Shane. But, they, I mean, all Billy Napier has, has, has been saying, hey, we're more experienced than ever. This is our best team. And how about this, Shane? Could it be, and you can answer after the clip here, but could it be, Shane? I mean, the guy that was, I think, the most disrespected, myself included, most disrespected player in the entire SEC last heading into last year was Graham Mertz. Florida, who sounds like he's getting even better. Let's, let's kick it over here to Billy. No, Graham is in year two. Um, he's starting. You think about what Graham did last year, right? He moved to a different country and learned a new language, essentially, right? New group of people. Um, Graham starts in with a leadership presence and credibility, right? He starts in January. You know, essentially, this is his team to some degree. Um, and I think that's probably the big takeaway is that he has a voice and a presence for the month of January, February, and March. Now we're in the football piece where that's even more impactful because he's communicating with the players each day. But yeah, I mean, Graham, I think has earned the respect of his teammates with the way he prepares, right? He's very, I mean, this guy lives in the building, uh, very process oriented. He's maximizing all parts of his day. Um, and he's an example. You know, we talk about the quarterback kind of being the standard bearer for the entire organization. Think about good teams. Typically, the quarterback sets the pace, right? So he's done that. You know, I think we, we are trying to get Graham to be more aggressive without being careless. You know, I think um, the narrative on him coming in, obviously, everybody talked about the interceptions at Wisconsin and all that. He proved that. Um, he could play clean ball last year, and then I think now it's about, you know, trying to uh, improve the calculated risk, right? Let's try to be aggressive and, and manage the game and eliminate careless play, but let's try to go create more explosives and distribute the ball, you know, be the point guard and push the ball down the court. All right, Shane, so I know all, all anybody wants to talk about this is the schedule when we talk about the Florida Gators, but is there a possibility – Let's say Graham Mertz, again, makes a huge improvement based on what he improved on last year. Let's say he's a top three quarterback in the SEC, which he may be even better than that. But let's just say top three. I mean, if if he continues to make those strides, could that be the catalyst for Florida, you know, making the postseason and and surprising a lot of people in the SEC? Well, I think Billy – that Billy said it, you know, how many good teams, great teams, you know, is, is, is driven by the quarterback on that squad. And, you know, here's a guy that we had on the bottom of our list, you know, coming into last season and Florida's going to suck because of the quarterback. We don't even know who's backing him up, you know? And then all of a sudden he becomes a, I'm not going to say like a Kyle Trask 2.0, but it kind of felt like it, you know, this guy that, nobody expected comes out here does phenomenal for for the task at hand and and now he's had a full off season said he's coming back we went from a quarterback that was on these on the shit list to like yeah i think i'm going to come back for another year and florida fans are pumped up so that gives them some more time to work with that youth and and uh i don't know man there's just something about these gators that i just everybody wants to just Put them out, you know, like just right. they don't have a shot. They're going to be at the bottom. I've seen four wins, two wins, you know, but there's still that shot that that this thing comes together, and if it does, it's because of their quarterback. Right, and, and you know, it's not often, Shane, that I see some emotion 
And, you know, a funny story from Billy Napier, but but, by goodness, Shay, we got one. I had to play this clip. And he tells a story of a six-year walk-on making plays down here at Gainesville. Now, maybe I'm a little concerned that a walk-on's making plays, but that's neither here nor there. Let's kick it over to Billy one more time. There's a play out there today, and you you guys and I have talked a lot about our walk-on program and how important it is. Um, We were lacking in that area. Uh, when we got here, and we've built, I mean, I would say we've got 116 players out there right now, and I think this fall we may be at 130, 135 for the first time. Um, there was a play today. Tyreek Norwood plays edge for us, okay, and he dropped into coverage today and intercepted a pass, okay. And you would have thought, I mean, the, both sides went nuts, okay, because Tyreek Norwood is a six-year player. Okay, he's a guy who was in school here, came to the walk-on tryout, gave us a million reps on the scout team, tears his ACL. Okay, this guy is construction management, right? He's in grad school. Okay, he just tore his ACL. I mean, most people would say, hey, my football career's over, right? But this guy uh, went through the rehab process, returned to play, He's out there as a six-year player that's a graduate student in construction management, picks off the pass, um, and the players went crazy. So uh, that's probably not one that you'll write about, but I think it is a sign that the walk-on program matters. He's having a good experience. Uh, He's been involved in the Gator Made piece. He has access to the resources the other players have, and uh, I think it's important on a football team that you appreciate everyone's role. Um, so that was a, a good one. No, I thought today. So I, I just thought that was a fun story, Shane, that, uh, again, if these guys hardly ever get any run, and the only time they do is when your team's getting killed or team's killing somebody, and, and they get in there. So uh, I, I like that little story there. I do too. I do too. And this is, again, this is the culture that we're creating. And it, and it felt like some of the pieces haven't been fitting down there, didn't work well, and they moved on. But there's a lot of guys that stayed, that came back. And, you know, here's a guy that had many opportunities to just start his career, whatever he wanted to do. And he wanted to come back and play one more time for the Florida Gators. So I love this. I, I think this is, a, like he said, this is not one you're going to have a, a movie about, but it kind of reminds when he said that, it, it reminded me of like the gladiators, you know. It's like the the ones that sit down there, maybe not the star of the show, but comes out and does the work and and, and makes the guy better. So I, that's kind of what they, they have down there in Florida. So, yeah, I, I love stories like this. Yeah, Stupefied says uh, that shades of Rudy right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How about uh, next day? We kick it all down to uh, Austin, where speaking of culture, speaking of uh, having an elite roster, you know, everybody's excited about the transfer portal. Who are we going to get? Who can we steal next in Texas? They got an NIL as good as anybody, as good or better than anybody. Sark was asked about it. Who, who are we going to get in the portal here? And I, I thought this was a really good answer. Steve, with the portal window opening again in two weeks, have you considered what you might need or how you might attack that portal window in two weeks? Um, I have an idea uh, internally. You know, and we're going to have some real discussions as a staff here uh, in the next week or so um, because I, I want to coach the guys that we got. Um, I, I do think we've got a really talented team. Um, we've got great depth on this team. It's incredible right now that – we're two spotting everything, and, and we're four deep at every position, um, which is which is great uh, that that we're able to do that naturally. I don't know if I'm necessarily going to the portal to say we got to get something, um, but I'm sure um, as we'll monitor it, there'll be some decent players that that go in, and then do they fit us? And one of the challenges with the portal, which we we touched on I think a week ago or so, is how do you get to know the the, the player? not just what's on tape, but the person, right? Because, you know, we, we try to do our best around here not to sacrifice character for talent and not to sacrifice character for talent, meaning, yeah, he's a really good player, uh, but maybe some of the off-the-field issues don't match up with the player. We've got such a good culture right now, and I think that's part of the reason why we win. Um, you know, we just want to make sure that we do our homework on anybody that we bring into the program this kind of this late in the game. 
Well, so this is more, Shay. We played other clips from Sark this spring. It was the best roster we've had. Is the most depth we've had. I love our experience. Now he's saying, well, hell, I don't care who. Well, he didn't quite go this far. But, but you know, they're not going to just add to add. It, it may mess up the culture that they have down here. But yeah. I, I think what he's really saying is, you know, we have got one hell of a roster. We may not even need help. Who cares who gets in the portal? And they can't <laughs> grab any SEC players anyway. But uh, I, I don't know. I mean, th- I think stuff like this is why so many people, yourself included, is so high on Texas. Yeah, because I don't I don't think they need any more. And if they do get them, I think it's going to be for a particular purpose. So, yeah, that, don't be surprised if Texas doesn't add one or two. But if they do, these are guys that probably aren't going to contribute immediately but may have an impact later in the season. Yeah, maybe they steal some of these Michigan guys just so they <laughs> get a win up there at Ed Arbor. Uh, but, uh, but another reason, Shane, obviously, that, that everybody's so high – on the Texas Longhorns is is Quinn Ewers is back. And again, it it was going back to what I said about uh, South Carolina and Arkansas. You know, when when you have your quarterback, you get like added points. And and we all know that's an important position. But uh, when you get a guy back with experience that has excelled, that led his team to a college football playoff and a Big 12 championship, you got him back. And based on what Sark says here, I mean, we may be getting the best Quinn Ewers yet. Let's kick it over to Sark one last time. Roger, go ahead. Quinn talked about the decision to come back. He kind of needed to slow his life down, one of the reasons. Do you notice that with him as, as close as you watch a quarterback, the maturation process and where he is right now compared to a couple of years ago? No, I, I think so. I think Quinn's really enjoying his time right now, and that's how you should be in year three. You know, when you – um, you know, I referenced this about Xavier a year ago, that it looked like he was having the most fun he had had in his three years and being here, you know, after year one, just hard charging, trying to get on the field. Year two for Xavier, you know, was a little up and down. He had the broken hand, was dropping some balls. He felt a little of that. Year three kind of came in with a renewed kind of joy for the game and with his teammates. Uh, and I feel that with Quinn. Like, he really enjoys his teammates. I think he really enjoys the challenge of getting that rapport with the receivers. I think he's got great rapport with this offensive lineman. Uh, and those runners. But now, what's that rapport like with those wideouts, with the new tight end, working with Gunner and and Amari and that group? So I think he's enjoying it. The the fun part for me is I get to keep coaching him hard, you know, and I get to keep coaching him hard on stuff that maybe I wasn't as hard on him with in the past. But that's how you keep pushing a guy uh, to to be the best that he can be. And um, he's taking the coaching, you know, and and he's playing at a really high level for us right now. And I, I don't know if you know the backstory. Shane, I'm, I'm sure most of the listeners do about Quinn Ewers, but I believe he was uh, the highest rated quarterback prospect ever among these recruiting services. He went and played at Ohio State because Texas didn't allow NIL <laughs> for high schoolers, and, and Ohio did. So he went up there and got, and got paid a bunch of money and came back. But point being, Shane, I mean, there, there's been probably, I can't imagine the pressure on this kid. I, I believe he's from Austin too, or or at least the surrounding yeah. area. So I mean, it's you know he's like the 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 golden child down there, highest prospect ever, you know, getting paid, which I got no problem with or anything. But again, it it just adds to the expectations. And and hell, I see it in the comments. You were the most overrated quarterback in the SEC. Well, it's because he's rated. You know what I mean? Like right. Nobody, nobody in their right mind was will say like Brady Cook's the most overrated, and I'm not saying he is, but he didn't come with right. the hype. You know what I mean? Yeah. So anytime there's hype, people just root for you to to fall on your face. They think you're overrated. They think you suck. And if we're getting a new Quinn Ewers, a more comfortable Quinn Ewers, someone that's actually having fun and not the weight of the world on his shoulders, who knows? That could unlock something even more in him in Sarkeesian's offense. And uh, I'm excited to see it. No, absolutely, man. And yeah, and the fact that he didn't crumble under that pressure, because you're right, being being in the spotlight, just playing for the University of Texas is a lot of pressure, you know, And but that's something that they do. I mean, look at the backup quarterback, for Christ's sake, you know what I'm saying? It's like... <laughs> That's that is a that is a position that is it's almost like the 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 CEO of a of a major corporation and and the fact that he didn't crumble he just came out and now like Sark talks it's like I don't have to go through A through 
Z anymore. You know, I, I'm on to the next chapter here with this kid, and we're fine tuning the details to make this a better ball club. So, yeah, they're in a sweet spot this year, and that's why I'm so high on Texas. And then one more where they're getting kind of, uh, you know, they're solid at quarterback, Shane. Maybe they're more solid than people realize. This guy can't play for Kayla DeBoer. He's no <laughs> Michael Penix, Jayla Milrow. Apparently he's tearing it up down there his first spring under his new head coach. Let's kick it over to Kayla DeBoer. How did Jayla Milrow look out there today? And, and could you update us on, on Jalen Hale, Hale as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jalen's just been really – Jalen Milrow has been super consistent. Um, you know, he's done a good job, I think, of just playing ball. And, um, you know, he's got that, that dual skill set, you know, being able to run and throw. And, uh, you know, now that we have enough things in where he can utilize uh, all of that, uh, you know, you can see even the play calling working around what he brings to the table. And um, he's tough to handle. Uh, he's just so extremely fast. And, you know, you think you, you kind of have a, you've got him bottled up and he just runs right around you. So. Um, he's done a really good job. You know, I think he's getting more and more comfortable with the offense every day, um, you know, especially when it comes to the pass game. Um, but, you know, there's just things where he has options to, to, to make a play with his feet. And uh, he's done that, I think, at the right time and being more and more comfortable just playing the game, you know, and finding ways to move the chains, uh, converting when he needs to convert, um, taking the shots when he needs to take the shots. So uh, I'm really proud of the way he's come along. <clears throat> I think as far as all right, Shane. So, and again, you, you got to remember this is just just uh, spring camp. So, you know, you know they're, they're not going full contact or anything with Jalen Milrow, but yeah. that will unlock something even more to his game. And, and the fact, of course, I, I you know I don't think Caleb DeBoer is going to come out here and bash him by any means, but just the fact that he's that he's praising him to this degree, um, it kind of leads me to believe that uh, DeBoer, you know, didn't realize how good Jalen Milrow actually was. Yeah, I think it's crazy. It's like you think of Milro, like if we took him back 20 years, we would have said this is God's gift to football, you know? I mean, look how, how high we are on Michael Vick and, mm -hmm. and, and these freak athletes that were not only a great quarterback but very mobile. But you look at the SEC today, Mike, I, I, I think this is the, the heaviest it's ever been with dual threat capabilities across the board. It's just going to be like human. It's just going to be like highlight reels constantly every weekend. And, and Jalen's going to lead it because again, he's shown that he could do it last year. Right. Well, the one team though, Shane, that uh, they have their answer at quarterback seemingly, but not seeing this guy enough to really get a good read on him. And of course I'm talking about the Kentucky Wildcats, Shane with Brock Vandegrift former five-star recruit, transferring from, from Georgia, of course. But uh, Mark Stoops, we, we got comments from uh, Brock Vandegrift here too, but I want to play Mark Stoops first because one of your favorite players, Shane, Barry and Brown, standout receiver, uh -huh. kick returner. Now he's, uh, you know, he's one of the veterans. He's, he's, he's the young guy making plays. He's, he's a splashy player, but now he's leading. Now they're asking him to do different things, be one of the premier players it, at the University of Kentucky. Let's kick it over to Mark Stoops. Barry on told us we asked him about being one of the older guys and then chafed at that old guy. <laughs> yeah. He said he's helping the young guys and yeah. it feels like this could be a good year. Have you yeah. seen a little more maturity? I, I've seen much more consistency with him. Yeah, I love it. You know, he's been really good and, uh, and you know, taking the medicine, so to speak. You know, really working hard to take the coach into little details. You know, sometimes when you're young and super talented, you know you could do special things with the ball in your hand. But it's all the little details and, and uh, that is going to make you that much better of a player. And he's been really fun to work with. He's had great energy and, uh, you know, always very explosive and he's made some good plays. And it's really nice because uh, it's not nice for me as a defense coach, but we've getting, we're getting the ball down the field more. And uh, it's aggravating on the defensive side, but it's fun, you know, on the offensive side. Talk about you right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and one thing that I'm hearing a lot that they're, that they're going to do under Bush Hamden, the new offensive coordinator, they're going to go tempo. So this could be 
a new look Kentucky offense. You know, that's not something that was a strength of theirs, but with these receivers and must be the confidence they have in Brock Vandegrift to run this system. Uh, I, I mean, I'm kind of excited because again, Kentucky used to be ground and pound play tough defense, but kind of to the point you just said, with, with all these quarterbacks we got in the SEC, I don't know that that formula is going to win you many games right now in this conference. No, no. But the reason that I'm high on Brock is because of those receivers. You think about all the quarterbacks that didn't start last year or this is their first start in the SEC. Look at the weapons that he will have around him. That's why I think the ceiling is a little higher with him than most of these new quarterbacks. Right. And, and so let's kick it over to him to wrap it up. Shane Brock Vandegrift. New quarterback. He talks about Liam Cohen leaving, new offensive coordinator, and how the uh, offensive installs go on this spring in Lexington. <clears throat> uh, the relationship with Coach, with, Coach, with Coach Hamden has been great so far. Um, basically, he's, um, he's, he's, he's really tough on us, and uh, that's what we're looking for. But then again, he's, he's good with us off the field and uh, being able to build that relationship. Um, so that's something you're always looking for. Um, he's hard on everybody, which is great. Uh, he tells you exactly what he wants, and if it's not how he wants it, then he's going to tell you that too. So uh, just, just really respect him and what he does, and I'm really liking the offense so far. Uh, I think the pace of play will obviously uh, pick up. Uh, Eli, the other day in the locker room, he sits right beside me and uh, he's like, dude, I, I, I don't know if I like it yet. He's like, I feel like we're doing two minutes every play. I said, dude, this isn't even fast. Like, this is this is normal stuff. And because uh, we're just running a normal up tempo offense. And uh, it was great to see today. Um, uh, we actually had like a little team period at the end, scrimmage ish. Uh, so being able to get up and get the signals and move the ball down the field was really well and, or really good. And uh, those guys definitely are, Eli told me that a couple weeks ago he's he's gotten a lot better about it now and he's he's great he's getting up there he's making the points he's doing his stuff and uh, that helps us be able to move faster and he's doing a great job up front uh-oh shane it may be annual off season i'm jumping on the kentucky bandwagon <laughs> God, he just looks like a quarterback, don't he? I mean, I, I, I don't know, brother. I, I think this is the spark that, that Kentucky needs. Uh, I, I just, I don't know. There's just something about his demeanor, uh, his mobility, the weapons, the offense. It's just, it's just, I don't know. The fact that the pressure's kind of off of him. Look, you're looking here. Vegas thinks six and a half, you know, so – if Kentucky comes out here and wins eight or nine, you know what I'm saying? They're giving coach another extension. Right. Yeah. So I don't know, Shane. I mean, and I, I just think Brock Vandegriff is potentially one of the biggest wild cards in the SEC, just because we don't know. I mean, what if he is that five star that, you know, that Lincoln Riley at Oklahoma, who all he does is seemingly pick great quarterbacks. That, that was a guy he wanted. He was committed. Uh -huh. You know, he's from Georgia, so at the last minute, right? I don't think it was the last minute, but before he's, you know, he obviously flipped to Georgia. And the only reason he's not on the field at Georgia is because Carson Beck's so good. You know what I mean? So <laughs> if he's, if he could be the second best quarterback in the SEC, he could still right. be on the bench. You know what I mean? So, and I'm not saying he's that good, but if he is, all of a sudden, Shane, this six and a half over under for Kentucky is ridiculous. And like you're saying, eight, nine, ten wins. It is possible if Brock Vandegrift is, you know, worthy of his five star billing. Absolutely. Looks like he came from Outer Banks, too, you know, that show that <laughs> my wife, she likes that, them and the kids. <laughs> Jackson Dart and him. They're going they're going snowboarding this weekend, I think. But yeah. uh yeah, I just I love that, man. They, that's just a little just I don't know, there's just a little bit of confidence in, in, in the way that they're talking up there, and I like that. It's yep. been a while since we've had it in Lexington. Mm -hmm. All right, buddy. So uh, that's all I got on the show. I know you're sick. You got anything else before we hop off the line? No, that that's it, man. Like I said, it was it's great catching up with everybody. Uh, I hope everybody has a, a great evening. And wash your hands because it's going around, <laughs> Mike. <laughs> well, I appreciate you, buddy, for showing up. Under the weather, I appreciate each and every one of you for hanging out, especially of those on the live show. We'll catch you on the next one. <laughs> See you guys. Go Vol.